so i think now we're at this sort of second revolution in neuroscience but theories are not experiencing the same revolution yet we need fundamentally new models of the brain that capture not just within region interactions ignoring everything else yeah. but treating each region as only a small bit of the of the vast ensemble it sits in this is brain inspired is the brain one big recurrent neural net yeah sure is it a bunch of interacting recurrent neural networks or rnns yeah yeah you bet how when needed do we switch from using some set of those rnns to some other set ah uh, all right i'm stuck actually we're stuck since none of us know yet but my guest today Kanaka Rajan is hot on the trail of this mystery. Kanaka recently took a professorship at Mount Sinai where she brought her bag of very useful tools that she can apply to a wide array of problems. Um, in the past, she has contributed a lot to our ability to tame and harness the often slippery uh, RNN. And she now uses those RNNs and other tools to understand how our brains produce behaviors and how regions within our brains interact to produce those behaviors. Recently, she applied her talents to help understand how we transition from actively resisting a like challenging situation to passively giving up on it. Uh, in this case, she used RNNs as a powerful tool uh, complementary to calcium imaging of the entire brain of zebrafish, while they go from regular old fish to a state of sort of throwing their hands in the air, uh, or their fins in the air, I guess, uh, and giving up all hope, somewhat like graduate students do at least once per week. Anyway, uh, we talk about that and how Kanaka thinks that using RNNs this way can be an alternative kind of connectomics to understand functional connectivity in our brains. We also touch on her work to create models that can uh, multitask, which is an ongoing challenge in AI and something that we need to understand better to understand our own brains. And as usual, we touch on a lot of surrounding topics, like the uh, current challenge for theory needing to keep up with this deluge of brain data that's being recorded these days. Uh, plenty of useful advice and more. Links to all this stuff can be found in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 54. I am Paul Middlebrooks. Uh, <laughs> you can get in touch with me by emailing paul at braininspired.co or on Twitter, I'm at pgmid, P-G-M-I-D. Uh, it makes me really happy to bring you guys these excellent guests and I hope that the podcast is setting off all sorts of ideas in your biological recurrent neural networks so that, uh, like Kanaka suggests, you, you can find like a little sliver of a problem and start to explore your way to really interesting places. Be well and be happy out there, and please enjoy Kanaka Rajan. Kanaka, we finally digitally meet. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm I'm really excited. I've uh, man, you know, even mixture of excitement and nervousness, but I'm delighted to be asked, and uh, <laughs> I'm excited. So I was um, just talking to an old friend uh, on the the old telephone last night, and he was asking me how the podcast was going. I was like, "Oh, it's good. I've got an interview tomorrow," and he said, "Oh, oh, where are you going?" I was like, "What do you mean? Huh. Oh, oh, they they must be coming through Durango, huh?" Huh. I was like I had I had to explain the, the entire internet concept to my oh, friend. Oh wow! There. Okay, that doesn't happen that often. I mean, right now I resent people that just pick up the phone and call me without texting me that they're calling me. I, I never answer the phone. Why yeah. would someone answer the phone? Why would someone answer the phone? Yeah, I don't know, but it's attached physically to my body, so you know, stands to reason. Yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway, that that conversation made me feel pretty advanced relative to my my friend who's aging like I am, right? But um. People like you have uh, always made me feel uh, very behind in everything I do. So thank you for that. 
Um, so, so kind of. We try. Your... We try. We work at it. <laughs> we have the secret club, and that's the goal. I think you do have a secret club. That, that club, it, and you're one of. It's a growing club, I guess, but it's always been there. Um, that club is a group of neuroscientists with a you know physics and engineering background and approach to things, and much of what you do is theory driven. And uh, I'm insanely jealous of your kin. I, this has allowed you to sort of choose what areas that you want to study, really. So I, I kind of want to start off just with a couple broad questions uh, about about this sure. this whole thing. So a lot of people on the show, when I ask them, you know, what would you do differently, or how would you approach things if you started now and stuff, they always often will say, you know, it's computational skills are important. I, I, I wish I had done more math. And even people well-versed in math will say this, you know, and I, you know, personally have the same feeling. I wish I had done more computational, had a, a better fundamental understanding of, of much in computation, right? Do you agree with that? And, and I kind of want your take on, you know, if whether you're surprised how how little maybe you see in the neurosciences? <laughs> um, I see a fair bit. Uh, you, but you know, the reasons I have the sort of circuitous math, physics, um, heavy background and my route to neuroscience has been sort of atypical, right? Like um, that has actually helped me um, in terms of, you know, the, the physics and math training, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit in your, um, in your question, which is there's this freedom, right? Like I can literally pick any class of problems within the broad realm of biology and yeah. look at it from this lens of the set of powerful tools that physics and math have, um, that my formal training in physics and math have provided. So, yeah, I think that everyone, especially now, right, given how advanced technologies are and how advanced computing technologies are people should absolutely have a you know quantitative background and it's never late right that's the beauty now it's not like you have to literally go to a class or anything now there's all these massively online courses to pick up the stuff that we need and it isn't that much it isn't 200 years of theoretical physics to make a dent in research problems it really isn't you don't have to read the principia from newton so yeah but, that's right but do you i mean so there is this sort of fundamental question of how much is enough to start off with fundamentally right and how much can be learned as you need it sort of in a just in time taking these online courses and stuff you know what's right. the right and I mean, just to throw another uh, cog here in the wheel, then there's the, you know, you've always been interested in neuroscience and in biological uh, intelligence in some way or another. So that has kind of guided you. It's not like you just thought, oh, I'm just going to study these, I'm going to study physics in case it comes in handy someday, right? There, there needs to be some sort of interesting thing that you're striving toward, right? Well, kind of, right? So my interest in neuroscience wasn't peaked until after I had gotten an undergraduate degree in engineering uh. and I was, you know, halfway through a master's program in physics. And so, you know, interest in neuroscience was really brought by uh, looking at the problem from the lens of my training mm. and from, you know, how much is enough. I think linear algebra is a good place to start. And very, very quickly, you can ramp up to, you know, the kinds of problems that I actually rigorously and analytically solve. And so the thing is, with, with neuroscience, we know so little. And there's so many unsolved problems yeah. that very, very quickly, even someone with, you know, not much more than a high school education in, in um, quantitative fields like math or physics can ramp up to an, uh, to really contributing to research in a matter of months. That said, everything can't be just acquired the data sciences uh, through an online course route. This require, I mean, you know, there is the the discipline and the philosophy of, you know, sitting down and writing equations and problem solving. And it, the discipline for me is the clearing the deck, hmm. right? I mean, I, it, it's philosophically, you know, the brain is gnarly. The biological brain finds gnarly solutions. Mm -hmm. And so to be, to have the discipline to say, okay, this is the small problem, a sliver of the problem that I am interested in solving. And these are the tools I'm going to use. That requires discipline. So clearing the deck, you mean getting rid of 
everything but and setting your sights on that one sliver of a problem on one sliver of a problem which you know looks small from yeah. the start it's <laughs> not like you know i can start with something like i want to understand memory that is not how the day to day <laughs> works yeah the day to day works with i want to understand the small sliver of a problem Why right? did like I forget how my does keys? the brain do so yeah. exactly or, yeah. or how does the brain solve this one small problem yeah and then can i build an artificial like a toy model that can solve that problem then compare the strategies that my toy used with the one that biological brain could use but that discipline is what my training taught me honestly everything else can be picked up yeah okay because as you, when you get old like me it's really hard you know the math is harder and harder to pick up as you age right so um, I don't know. This is a constant question that I get in emails too. You know, like wanting people wanting advice on how to start and stuff. So um, it's linear algebra. I'm telling you, algebra. literally, it's like you know, follow Gilbert Strang's video lectures, which mm -hmm. you know are now available, and then do the homework exercises in the back. Then literally pick up one of the homeworks that people post from their computational neuroscience courses, and yeah. you'll surprise yourself. <laughs> Hopefully, I hope that's true. Yeah, it, it is a hundred percent. The kind of work that you do, it's right in between AI and neuroscience, really, or can be, right? Um, you know, do you feel like your work applies as much to artificial intelligence work as it does to neuroscience? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the questions is what should, you know, brain research, neuroscience, and AI be doing less of? It's literally the, you know, rec you know, stop fighting and recognize the fact that the two fields are really two sides of the same coin. The goals are slightly different, right? Yeah. The goal of traditional AI machine learning is to build the best tool that does something. The, the original goal, though, was to understand minds, I think. That's right. And, so That's right. So that's yeah. right. Somewhere along the way, we've gone, we've diverged a little into an engineering focused, let's build the smallest thing that can do the most things model mm -hmm. versus someone like me who wants to say, okay, I'm going to take the innovative and technological explosions from AI. But my goal is to understand how the brain would solve that problem, mm -hmm. given only the machinery that the brain has access to. So that is the constraint and the lens through which I'm looking at the problem. So, you know, so take, for example, you know, multitasking, right? Yeah. It's a thing that we do, animals do effortlessly. We do many, many things. And of the many tasks we do, they're chunked into many actions that have to be threaded exactly right yep. in the right order. So from an AI perspective, right, if I were working in a traditional AI field, my thing is, how do I build the smallest network with the fewest components that can do the most massive array of things, right? And then, you know, I want to go sell that or whatever, right? What I'm keen on is to understand, well, okay, so the brain does do this thing, right, of many, many tasks. I'm capable of having this parallel thread of, you know, thinking in my brain about why is he asking me this versus also actually having a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. So the question about neuroscience here that I'm keen on is what in the brain is tracking what task I'm engaged in and when it's time to switch. There has to be something in the brain that's monitoring, okay, I'm engaged in this task and yeah. these are the switch points. And that's something that I think is, uh, you know, a kind of a big unanswered question that of course can go both ways. Yeah. The better models of this kind of tracking ability that we have, the better we're able to build AI, but also understand the brain. I think that's right. It's come up a lot on the show. Um, and, and just in neuroscience in general, there's, you know, there's proposed two systems that operate in some domain, right? And then the question is always, like, yeah, but how does it switch between the two, uh, the two systems, the two ways of doing it, right? And so uh, this is open in a lot of different fields. So, yeah, it's an important question. That's right. That's right. So what in the brain, like, where do you look for this thing, right? This thing that's a state tracker. That thing has to have, you know, a steady representation while I'm having this conversation with you. But when I'm done talking to you, that thing needs to switch to a different mode to say, okay, right. task over. Right. Now, look at it from the disease perspective, right? I mean, I'm at Sinai and, you know, I, I, I'd sort of be an idiot to not think about that, right? But let's say I take a sip of a glass of wine and I know that action is complete. I put it down and I do that until, you know, I'm done drinking my glass of wine. But suppose that system that tracked when the task was over and when it was time to switch failed mm -hmm. or just refused to track it at the right transition points. I could have compulsions, addictions. 
I could fail to complete movements because, you know, I was um, repeating the same sets of movements because a tracker was broken. Mm-hmm. So where does, where in the brain do I look for such a thing? What time scales do its activity patterns vary like? And, and, and so on. Yeah, this is, uh, well, first of all, I'm glad you're drinking wine while we're talking. <laughs> So I'm not, uh, I'm no, I, I know I, you picked up your fake wine glass, your bottle of water. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, so y- you've been working with uh, recurrent neural networks since uh, before it was cool. You know, it's right. really cool these days. Um, you've done a lot of work dealing with like the chaos that made RNNs difficult to work with, and uh, with how they can be used for things like memory and sequence processing and so on. So we're about to get into some of your work in particular, but why are recurrent neural networks in particular good models for brains? Well, the brain is recurrent. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the simplest um, answer possible here. The brain isn't, you know, brain doesn't transmit information unidirectionally from one group of active neurons to the other without any feedback loops. Even in the primary sensory areas, right, like the visual cortex, connections go back and forth. There's an incredibly rich network of feedback connections. Recurrence is what drives it. Now, a slightly deeper answer to this is that recurrence buys you some very cool properties, Mm. mostly in terms of processing things in time. And so that can only come from feedback loops. And so when you brought up these chaotic networks, there used to be this thing in the field, right? Like chaos is bad uh, because you make a small perturbation and, uh, you know, things can flail out into, you know, unpredictable trajectories. And, and for a long time, networks that produced chaotic activity were considered unusable. Well, they were, un- they were unusable in that, in that they were unpredictable. They weren't solving the problems, right? You, they couldn't be trained. That's right. That's right. And then innovative people showed up and figured out how to, you know, quote unquote, harness this this sort of chaotic patterns of activity into meaningful patterns of activity. Mm -hmm. And so I've contributed to that body of work and so forth. But but the key is that, you know, at the so there are sort of two main issues. So there is a thing as less chaos and more chaos. This mm-hmm. was a thing that I learned during my work in my PhD on networks that were spontaneously chaotic, but could be channeled to do useful things nonetheless. Okay. So there are things that are, you know, in the regime of fully chaotic and unusable, but there are also things that are less chaotic and could be used. So, for example, my entire thesis was about how inputs, like subtle inputs, could influence the pattern of spontaneous activity. So you, while I'm having this conversation with you, I'm not shutting off all of the rich thoughts and daydreams that occur right. in my brain, right? right. So right. there is that aspect. The second major thing is that at the point when these networks become chaotic, there's a critical slowing down. And this comes from, you know, actually solving these equations in an idealized setting, which may or may not have much to do with the real brain's operation, Mm. but have guided our intuition till today. That critical slowing down is responsible for for explaining a lot of how we can do things over time. Is the uh, do you mean by the critical slowing down? Are those the the fixed point attractors? Or are those the attractors that it's re- slowing down in That's the regime? That's right. So okay. it's related to that. That yeah. it is exactly related to that. Hmm. Now I just want to talk about chaos the rest of the time, but we'll come back to it, I suppose. Okay. Cool. So, I mean, obviously, yeah, RNNs, that's, they're the way to go. They Our are brains the aren't just feed, feed forward. They just are, right? I mean, the question is really back to, you know, do you want to understand the functioning of the brain with the constraints of the machinery that the brain has? Yeah. Or do you just want to build a device that does something better than the brain does, which is, you know, great also. Computers outperform us every day. Every day. Uh, all right. So... Here's my goal for the rest of today's show. Um, I'm going to hammer you with really stressful questions, and I'm going to be unsatisfied with all of your answers. Lovely. And over the course of the show, my hope uh, is that I will affect your, you know, serotonin and uh, send you into a downward spiral from an active, enthusiastic participant into a passive, nearly non-responsive pool of depression. Does that sound good? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, let's see how it goes. Okay, let's so, see. Let's see how much violent thrashing occurs, and uh, you know, en route to this. <laughs> so I'm referring to uh, this recent paper that you uh, were a part of here, uh, called "Neuronal Dynamics Regulating Brain and Behavioral State Transitions 
And this is a uh, nice example of what's happening a lot lately is just kind of a massive collaboration between a lot of different people uh, coming together, a lot of different parts coming together to answer these these questions. And your role in this thing was, was it mostly modeling using the recurrent neural networks? That's right. So I was the lead theorist um, on this project. The lead experimentalist, of course, was my, you know, long-term collaborator and friend Carl Dizerath, who, mm-hmm. whose lab also provided all of these data from experiments that Aaron Andelman in his lab uh, performed. And so, yeah, we're in this era where, you know, it, it, these problems have gotten very hard for one person to just uh, to lift. So, yeah, we're in that in that time. Plus you, you, plus, you can't publish anymore unless you've done the modeling and the behavior and the optogenetics and, you know, bring it all together, right? So, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's just to kind of set up what was done, you know, what, so what are active and passive coping? Right. So, um, you know, in, in life, right, we're constantly evaluating amongst actions and figuring out whether whether doing something is worth the effort, right? Like including this, you know, charming interview that I'm, I'm, I'm currently in. Oh. So, you know, how optimistic or pessimistic I feel is influenced in large part by how, how these um, choice of actions has yielded fruit in the past. And so, you know, if if you keep repeating actions and they keep failing, you become hopeless, right? In the extreme, hopelessness can, um, you know, cause things like depression. Mm-hmm. And so hopelessness is one of the hallmarks of depression. And it's defined as the deep discounting in the value of effort applied. Mm. And so this is seen in many, many animal models, as well as obviously in human studies. And so a lot of work was done on rodents before, including, by the way, um, in Carl's lab, um, about, you know, animals in various laboratory settings, and they were stressed, and the stresses have to be persistent and inescapable. Mm -hmm. And animals would initially try to avoid the stress by vigorously trying to move away, right? I mean, this is what animals do. That state of trying to, you know, fight against the stress and leave the situation is active coping. But if those actions are ultimately fruitless, with, you know, enough persistent and inescapable stress, you go into this mode where you don't thrash around anymore, or movement cease completely in some cases. So that in a more sort of complex setting is known as learned helplessness, or more generically, passive coping. So, you know, active to passive coping, there's like a line between the two. It's a continuum. Yeah. And in disease cases, you become, you you lapse into passive coping earlier. And in response to medications, you may, you may delay the onset of passive coping. And so what they did in their experiment, uh, in, this, in this beautiful set of experiments, was to, you know, figure out a zebrafish model. Mm-hmm. So larval zebrafish have, you know, many, many advantages, but they, you know, figured out this way of stressing larval zebrafish until they lapsed into passive coping. And they, these are just like little mild shocks, right? That's delivered. right. They're yeah. little mild shocks that are delivered. And initially, when the shocks arrive, the fish whip themselves vigorously and try to escape. But if the stresses keep coming, if the shocks keep coming, and they can't escape the scenario, fish become immobile. And, you know, that is passive coping. But in these experiments, you could track the tail whips in real time, and monitor almost the entire brain with cellular resolution through this whole experiment. Yeah. Which is another advantage of the zebrafish, just because they're translucent, right? That's exactly right. And you can do really good imaging um, and optogenetic manipulations in them. They have a powerful set of genetic tools. But from a theorist's perspective, right, this Mm -hmm. kind of sampling is unparalleled. So in right? So in mice, they have, you know, 71 million neurons and the best experiments can capture, you know, less than a hundredth of the of the electrical activity of this entire ensemble. But here you can record everything with with cellular resolution, practically everything. Well, yeah, right. Just to back up, I guess the, the behavioral question was, what is this transition from active coping to passive coping? And then sort of the neuroscience and modeling question is how does that transition happen? What's happening in the so the neuroscience question is where is it happening in the brain and what's happening in in the brain? I guess because uh, in the past, passive coping has been associated with just a, a ton of different neural regions based on previous studies, right? Um, so this thing is like looking at the transition from 
uh, active coping to passive coping in the brain. Where does it happen? Uh, how does it happen? And this is where like the modeling work comes in as well, right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So we know by just looking. So the only thing the animal is telling you is at, at what point it stopped thrashing, right? That's yeah. literally the only thing that you can, that's the only reported variable here. The rest is through measurements and through modeling, through principled theory, as well as, you know, and computational models to pick out signatures of the mechanisms that drive this active coping and passive coping transition. So from measurements alone, right, they knew that there were a few regions that are involved in this. Yeah. They knew how these regions could behave in response to um, the stressor. So by looking at activity directly, but then how these dots are connected and what are the meaningful signatures that are driving this transition? What sort of connectivity changes brain-wide mediate this? Is there something common between uh, the motif that, let's say, my model extracts in zebrafish and the models that I build with my mice collaborators will, um, will extract? I mean, the commonalities are interesting, but the divergences are also fascinating. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that's why I think we need uh, these these. T- you know, experimentalists and theorists working together. So, you know, I, you know, a, a, an interesting piece of data sparks my interest. I build a model. I make a prediction that they then verify, which refines my models. It has to be this intimate loop. Yes. Well, um, maybe we can just go over like so the um, the neuroscience results, and then I want to get into the the modeling because it's it's really cool the way that you approach this. So, um, okay, so you have these zebrafish. They were given this behavioral challenge where they were induced into a passive coping from an active coping state. And I mean, the main results, I guess, are in the Habinula and the, the Rafe. Do you want to do you want to just sort of just summarize what was seen in the Habinula and the Rafe? So what they got from the measurements alone, well, they got two things from the measurements, right? One was the fact that, you know, these tail whips, if you look at the, you know, the number of whips the fish makes um, through the experiment, that in in the case of the challenged fish decreased slowly until it ceased, right? So that's Mm -hmm. sort of the behavioral measurement. By looking at the neural activity during this time, Aaron extracted two salient signatures. One was that the habenula seemed to ramp up its activity. So there was this, you know, slow and steady increase in the excitation in this one region, the habenula. Which had classically, uh, in in people who are depressed, it has higher activity, et cetera. That's right. That's right. So hyperactivation of this this region is known to be implicated in in depression. And I'm choosing my words rather carefully here because, you know, it's in this, you know, brain-wide ensemble. Yes. The second um, neural signature was that the raphe nucleus, which is known to be downstream of the habenula in fish as well as in mice, um, that decreases its activity and then sort of asymptotes throughout the experiment. So those were sort of the salient findings, the experimental findings in this um, in this article. And then in you come with your recurrent neural networks. That's right. <laughs> so what was the purpose of, of modeling these things? So one is, well, what caused this, right? I mean, you know, it's this it's this gross manipulation at, from the outside. Something is coming in, right? There's this shock that's given to the tank and this fish with its head fixed. So what is changing brain-wide? Right. I mean, they have activity from all of these, um, all of these, you know, you know, 10,000 neurons at a time at minimum, 10,000 yeah. to 40,000 neurons yeah. imaged over, you know, an hour long, half an hour to an hour long experiment and with the tail velocities. So what's causing the habenular activity to go up? Um, and, you know, at what point does the raffi decide to get engaged and what's driving that? And ultimately, who's shutting the movement down, causing passive coping? Mm-hmm. So to look at this massive data set and to extract motifs that are correlated with these activity patterns, modeling was required to build a, a, an almost an artificial like a meta fish that, you know, captured as many of these experimental features as possible, but one that I had built so I knew what its wiring would reflect. And, you know, could I test the wiring predictions on, you know, actual larval zebra fish? This is, this is what is, you know, the, under this umbrella of this often overused term, you know, mechanistic understanding. Well, one of the really, I don't know, I don't know how often this is done, but one of the things that jumped out at me uh, as being interesting is that 
So, so they recorded a ton of neurons, right? And then in your model, you could make as many units in your model as there were neurons that were recorded. So it's that's like a... right. I can make more as well. So well, sure. you know, if I'm modeling the mouse, I would be, you know, this is this is where the power of building these models comes in, right? So you know, if I'm let's say recording a hundredth or a thousandth of the number of units as there are in the animal, yeah. I can still build a much larger network and then subsample from it. In the fish case, right, I could build a 10,000 unit network, no sweat, mm -hmm. and then train each unit to look exactly over time as the as its 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 partner neuron did in the real fish. Which is how you trained the models, correct? Which is how these models are trained, yes. Okay, so you have you trained the models to uh, on the population activity that was recorded from the zebra fish. That's right. And then, I mean, there's a nice figure in the paper where, of course, the unit activity perfectly overlaps with the uh, recorded neuronal activity. Very nice. That's um, right. and, and then you could compare the activity of the models. So there, so there were models trained to the pre-behavioral challenge before right. the passive coping was induced in the in the zebrafish. And then you could compare those to the models trained to the neural activity after uh, the the passive coping was induced. So so what did the models tell us? So so the way this works is, you know, I take a recurrent network completely randomly wired um, and to say, okay, here are these model neuron like units. They're of course not not, you know, entirely biological. They're missing many of the bells and whistles. But you know, the way it works is I take um, each unit and its activity, which let's say in the spontaneous case could be chaotic or irregular, mm -hmm. and I train it by this learning rule to match the calcium imaging data directly, a calcium fluorescent signal acquired from that particular neuron. So in this case, every neuron in this network has a partner neuron that provides it target functions. And the partner neurons, of course, in the real fish. So I train this um, network in you know three epochs in this paper. So there's a baseline period, which is you know the first six minutes of the experiment. Then there's, of course, the next six minutes we, during we, like the early phase of the shocks. And then towards the end, after the shocked fish have lapsed into this passive coping or immobile state, then, of course, there's a third network. Well, so just to interrupt with the so so the the activity that's being recorded uh, with the calcium imaging, it's an analog signal, right? It's like like that's an activation right. function. So it's not a spiking network that you're training. It's like that's a right. regular old. Uh, neural network, so you That's have an activation right. function, and it's a constant, uh, continuous signal, not spikes. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, these are rate-based units within these networks. And so, you know, it was convenient that the experimental data set was, you know, calcium imaging. It was nuclear localized yeah. GCAMPs for what it's worth. So yeah. it was, I mean, we knew that what was glowing was was an actually a neuron. So that was, uh, that was another sort of power of the experiment that we leaned on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, training these analog, uh, analog signals helped okay but but you know the key is that okay sure we these these networks are incredibly powerful right and the reason they're powerful is because the thing that we're changing varies at the square of the number of neurons you see so while i'm training 10,000 neurons it's 10,000 square number of free parameters so i could do anything with them right i mean yeah. they these i mean i could train them to ballet dance and and lapse into passive coping simultaneously <laughs> right so these are very very powerful networks so the question is well okay so the thing that i derive from them that's the key right once you've trained this of course you can train them they work the surprising thing is the interaction matrices that you can derive from the trained network afterwards, which we don't have the foggiest idea how to do with measurements alone. There is no connectome for the fish. There is, a, is not, no connectome for the mouse and certainly not for humans, um, at least for, for a long time. Right. And so these interactions really reflect the pairwise influences of one neuron in the, in the fish to another neuron in the fish. That's what gives you these little arrows between region one, region two, and region three, and up to region 21 that really drive this behavior. And you, and you so you, this is like sort of a modular kind of model. So you had, how many regions were you, uh, did you set up? 
So they have about 15, so depending on the fish, somewhere around 15 to 21 regions. Oh, I see. So it's... Uh, that are simultaneously imaged. So yeah, we just take a network as that big and train them all. I see. And then you can you can look at the interconnected interconnections uh, within a region and then also between regions. That's exactly right. In in the first, in the in the paper that you're uh, you were you know you, we're currently discussing the paper that came out last year, I think maybe no, it came out this year, right? So in that paper, we focused on the Habenula and the Rafe alone because mm-hmm. those were the those who had the closest link to the um, experimental findings in that paper. So right. we you know trained the whole brain network, but we looked at it from the lens of just the Habenula and the Rafe. I see. What we're doing now in a subsequent manuscript is to train and uh, analyze this entire brain-wide connectivity. So we're deriving these directed interactions, and we're also chunking this experiment into finer epochs. So we have these tensors that go, um, you know, so each, it's like a loaf of bread. Each slice is one of these matrices. Mm-hmm. But as you go through the the loaf, it's this matrix, and it captures the experiential and behavioral state of the animal. So it's really what I'm saying is what what we have now is a chance to develop a whole new kind of connectomics. Are you guys writing that up right now? Or we is are. It, uh, we are yeah? currently oh, in the process cool. of writing that manuscript. So oh, yeah, we're very, very nice. excited. And you can't talk to anyone about it. If a paper comes out, it means they did the work about 600 years ago. So it's... Right. Yeah, it's, exactly. <laughs> or at least so, in neuroscience. Yeah. Not so okay. in, in AI. But okay. But just to sort of, um... uh, the, you know, what they refer to as a as a paper is a it's a very generous definition of the word paper. <laughs> uh Oh, we're getting into the politics now. Yep, sorry. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, OK, but just OK, then to get back uh, to what you found in the model in this ancient now paper. Um, so, <laughs> so so what did what did you find in the models, um, you know, in terms of connectivity within areas and between areas? And how did that match with the neuroscience results? So there were a few things we found. The the biggest were, okay, you know, when we compared the overall distributions of the interactions within these matrices that were composed of connections within the Habenula, within the Rafe, as well as projections going from the Habenula to the Rafe and Rafe back into the Habenula, we found that there was an almost 20% increase in in connectivity in the submatrix relative to the rest of the brain between control and shocked fish. So that was the first result. Most of these synaptic changes that were, you know, the strengthening of, of weights was driven by the habenula, where we saw a concomitant increase in the synaptic weights as well. Um, and, and we also saw the surprising thing of these connections strengthening in the projections between the raphe to the habenula. To Raphae to the habenula, which Raphae is classically... to the habenula, which is classically backwards, right? Mm-hmm. So classically, we know that there's a habenula Raphae projection, and the model is, okay, bad stuff happens, the habenula <laughs> goes, bad stuff's happening, you know, projects the Raphae, which dumps serotonin, and say, don't worry, the cavalry's here. If that helps you feel better, then great, but if if that doesn't help, then something shuts the movement down, Right. So we're now in the second manuscript looking for what is shutting the movement down. And I'm thinking that maybe it's related to this backward projection from the Raffae to the Habenula. It may not, it doesn't have to be a, so the reason I call these directed interactions and not synaptic connections is because I'm keeping it general. It's functional connections, that they're not, you know, monosynaptic projections or something. It can be an indirect effect. And so these were surprising things that were inaccessible from measurements alone. Yeah. it's. I mean, you know, to me, like the modeling work is such a large part of it. And then when you actually read the paper, uh, it's sort of, is it the last paragraph maybe before the uh, discussion? I'm not sure. But it's not like an afterthought, but it's just the, the amount of space that it takes up in the paper isn't nearly as much as the amount of space it takes in my mind. So... Right. Well, hence the hence the the second manuscript that explores these in much more detail. Yeah. You know, there's a lot that goes into putting together this paper. So really, like, you know, if you look at the first draft or something, it had like 87 figures and uh, (laughs) that is just impossible. Many, many, many components. I mean, the fact that these experiments, I mean, these experiments were heroic. So in the first paper, they were center stage. Yeah. In the in the next paper, we're going to take a different track and we're going to look at these computationally focused brain-wide interactions in these multi-region models. So it's the same model, though, but you're just including more of, more analysis on the 
So, uh, so it has it has a few changes. We're also doing things like you know we're uh, we're uh, restricting the plasticity. So we're gonna say you know between region plasticity is a little less uh, full than within region plasticity. And then I told you already about stacking many of these matrices in a logical manner over yeah. over time and epochs. So then you know all of the powerful tools from math and physics with uh, with tensors comes back into play. And so we're we're discovering kind of cool things brain wide. All right. So you've got then you made these models, uh, and it it shows the interconnectivity between you know w- within the habenula and the Rafe to habenula connectivity. And now, and uh, I mean, I haven't read this new manuscript that has six hundred figures at this point. I imagine. But, so but, so where is it all going here? Well, so I I see this going in. Um, Okay, so th- this is going to take a little bit of babbling to get right, if that's all right. We like babbling. I think it is also related to where the field is going. Mm, mm. So I think now we're at this sort of second revolution in neuroscience. When I first started in um, in neuroscience, you know, longer ago than I care to admit at this point, <laughs> you know, we theorists were in, in some sense ahead of where neurotechnologies and experimental neuroscience was, right? We were at the place where we were recording single neurons at a time. Nothing wrong with that. There is nothing, nothing wrong, wrong with that. With that. Absolutely right. not. Whew. But I'm talking about the direction in which... <laughs> trends are going right yeah yeah so then we were building these theories of you know n tends to infinity limits and randomly connected ensembles and using insights from statistical mechanics which were incredibly powerful right so then that went on now we're at the second revolution right so we went from the single units to you know recording populations of neurons now we're recording from many, many regions with cellular resolution over very fast timescales, but also over the duration of long behaviors. We're also living in hypersensed environments anyway. Mm -hmm. So all the way from humans to animal models, we're able to capture, you know, behavior in exquisite detail. So we're at that revolution. With the ability, ability to do all these things. The ability to do all these things. That's right. But, you know, current neurotechnologies uh, let you monitor, you know, thousands of neurons at once over long periods of time, even in awake behaving mammals, sometimes simultaneously in interacting mammals, which Mm -hmm. is very cool. Mm -hmm. So, but, but theories are not experiencing the same revolution yet. So to make sense of data from these experiments, but also to, you know, in some sense, keep up, we need fundamentally new models of the brain that capture not just within region interactions, ignoring everything else, but treating each region as only a small bit of the of the vast ensemble it sits in, capturing between region interactions, looking for things like signal gating between regions. So all the principles of inter area communications. And so we have to look at interactions brain wide and build theories of that. But my pet is still to look at um, these from the lens of constraining to the machinery that the brain has got access to. Well, right. So by building networks of networks, right? That's right. So that's what that is what I'm doing now. I build um, build these networks of networks that are constrained directly by experimental data, and then I either you know neural data or behavioral data, and in some cases both, which hmm. is a hint of what is to come in uh, the second manuscript. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but you know, the, the key is really that I'm able to reverse engineer them and bring the same sorts of tools to bear, the same tools from random matrix theory and tensor analysis and, you know, all of that good stuff onto these now richer ensembles. Yeah, it was, um, I had David Cicillo on my show a long time ago now. And he, one of the things I remember he said is like, you know, we're, we're recording more and more neurons. And the question is, what are we going to do with them? <laughs> and and I had this experience when I was uh, a postdoc even going, I, I started my postdoc was still recording single neurons uh, in awake behaving monkeys. And then over time, you know, we got bigger and bigger electrodes and record more and more. And I had this conversation with Jeff Shaw, my advisor. I was talking about some different tweaks we could do to the task. And then we, you know, can record more. And he said, yeah, but what are we going to do with all the data? We have all this data that's just building and building and building. Who's going to, what are we going to do with all of that old data then? Like, that's where right. is it going to go? And so this is an that's ongoing right. problem. Um, that's right. That's right. I think more is not necessarily better. We're with theory able to make predictions for what the minimal set is. 
for example. Yeah. So I'm not saying more is necessarily better, although that is the trendy trend. Um, I think what what theorists can provide is some numbers to our experimental colleagues and say, this is the minimal set. This is where you look for the interesting behavioral drivers. These are the timescales at which they vary. Mm -hmm. And this is the minimal set. And maybe it's conserved across species, but maybe it's divergent across species. But, you know, we're, we're to look to insights from Eve Martyr. That there are many ways to skin this particular fruit. Yeah. Well, okay. So this is good stuff. So that so this is one of your pushes in your in your work is you have these different regions and how they interact with each other and how they're interacting internally. Uh, and then I, another thing I wanted to talk about, you have this. I I'm, I think it's in press now. It's maybe not out yet, but uh, it is which is it's in press. So. Um, well, the, the paper is, it's a little review paper called how to study the neural mechanisms of multiple tasks. Um, so then this is a different sort of push in, in your work. I, do, I don't know. Do you want to just kind of compare it to this interregional? Sure. Sure. So, you know, I, I mean, there's, a, it's not a comparison so much as a second sort of interrelated, uh, direction in my lab. And I think I talked about this ve at the very beginning as well, when we were talking about this AI neuroscience drift. Um, and so I can, you know, pull from that as well a little, maybe. Yeah. Well, so there's, I mean, in, in AI, there's the problem of transfer learning, which is like a really open challenge, a big problem still. And so, to get networks to perform multiple different types of tasks is an ongoing challenge. And there's that's right. Right. So, so, you know, this is a problem that is faced by, you know, essentially two of the leading fields studying this kind of thing, right? Like multitasking is the thing that is studied by AI machine learning approaches. Like how do we build the smallest machine that can do the most variety of things yeah. without forgetting the previous things it has learned. So that is a, that is a big push. I'm interested in a slightly um, different direction of that. I was going to say, so, you know, I had uh, Matt Botvinnik on the show and you know, we talked a little bit about meta learning and now every paper I see has the, the word meta learning in the title, you know, <laughs> coming out. Right. So, which is learning how to learn. Right. And, and, and multitasking is also, there's this, this huge, you know, explosion. So, you know, how is your approach to this problem different th from those? Right. So um, I, I, it's, it's complementary, I would say, right? Mm. Like I'm still driven by the primary desire not to build the smallest thing that can do the most things better than humans can. But I want to sort of understand how the brain does it with, the, uh, with its machinery only. So I want to understand this one key functionality within multitasking. So, you know, the brain could solve many, many tasks by either being one homogenous bag of neurons <laughs> yeah. and then train many, many outputs, one for each task being performed, right? In which case, the prediction would be that you record from a population and there would be a bunch of, you know, uh, mixed selective neurons, for example, you know, classic work from, you know. Uh, uh, Stefano Fusi's lab also worked from Insanali at all recently yeah. about these atypical, you know, tuning um, across populations that is seen in many parts of, um, of of the mammalian brain. Yeah. So that's sort of one modular one one module solution. Then there's the other solution in which everything is specialized. Right. We know the brain has many regions, and so each region could have a very specialized function. And they're then collectively, they cooperate or compete or, you know, interconnect in clever ways and solve the problem. So both of these are unrealistic models of the brain in <laughs> multitasking, right? So somewhere in between is the solution that has, you know, features of flexibly learning many things, but maybe not doing everything 100% perfectly. And so one of, again, this comes back to my training, right? I want to clear the deck mm. and, you know, laser focus on one aspect of this problem that I think could, could potentially be this, the, the key to uh, figuring out where on this continuum the brain is. And so that sliver for me is figuring out, well, when, if we're doing multitasking, someone in the brain has to be monitoring you know, what task I'm currently engaged in and when it's time to switch to the next task. So where's the state tracker in the brain? Mm -hmm. And what time scales does its activity look like? What happens when the state tracker um, is broken? And how do you correlate that with, you know, timing deficits or inability to stop doing things in time or festinating and those types of, you know, neuropsychiatric 
issues. But even from a basic sciences perspective, that's the sliver problem that I'm currently interested in. And of course, you know, scale that up to other settings. Very good. So actually, the um, I mean, the, the paper that I'm alluding to here, one of the co-authors is um, Michael Cole, uh, with whom I was in graduate school way back when. Oh, so, I see. Yeah, so it's good to see his name on there. I and, see. I um, see. Mike, one of the things that he was doing in graduate school and he's, you know, continued to do is this sort of task switching uh, work. You know, there's this big automatic versus controlled processing that humans are known to, you know, switch between. And I've had plenty of people on the show. Uh, Roshan Cools talks about, has, has talked about neuromodulation and its role in switching between flexible and uh, stable uh, regimes of behavior. So, so this task switching is such an important Thing moving forward. And uh, we're not going to go back to phrenology where it's just super, super modular, right? Uh, back in the day. But like you said, it's the brain is not just a bag of uh, of neurons where every neuron is mixed, is infinitely mixed selectively. That's not a phrase, but I'm going to use it. Uh, <laughs> but then, okay. Gnarly, so there has to be, right? That's another technical gnarly. term. I like, I like, I like yeah. gnarly. Yeah. I'm going to maybe start using gnarly. Yeah. But so, what does this mean for um, you know using these network models to model the brain moving forward? I mean, are, are we just going to end up with uh, as many RNNs connected together as there are modules in the brain, and then a task switcher, or what? What's it? What's it going to look like? Personally, I would like a minimal set mm -hmm. constrained by behavior, right? Like, let's find a class of behavior. So that I'll tell you what the 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 next sort of paper in the series that I'm writing is about, Great. for example, right? Yeah. So one of the things is, okay, can you know, I just told you about this continuum, right? Is the brain a bag of neurons with many outputs, each doing a different thing? And that's how we get it to to multitasking or is it where every module is its own specialized you know your phrenological um, analogy and one of those modules could be the state tracker so what i'm trying to do is to find the knob that goes smoothly between these two and then the thing that makes the knob stop turning is experimental data so you know a person that that has you know has really influenced my thinking on this is Anne Churchland, mm -hmm. who works a lot on um, and also you know work from you know my postdoc advisor David Tank for example. These are yeah. people that focus very you know they have uh, always the behavior of the animal in the back of their minds, and so they so so let me give you the. So, so the curiosity, right? So one thing that I was curious about in my postdoc is, well, there are sequences everywhere, right? That there are these, you know, temporally ordered waves that appear in the hippocampus, right. they're there in the striatum, they're there in the parietal cortex. They're there kind of everywhere you look, A, because we can't stop uh, sorting things, but also because what if they're not doing what we think they are, right? What if the, the role of sequences is really to track that we're seeing sequential patterns in regions with vastly different anatomies and functional properties relative to behavior is because really all they're marking is when the task is occurring and when it's time to switch. Mm. And the actual computation is either being performed by a mix of these with the other ones that we're tossing in the garbage or the ones that don't look sequentially modulated at all. Then you go, well, why sequences at all? Maybe we were seeing fixed points before because behavior was a little constrained. We let behaviors become slightly more naturalistic. We're seeing sequences everywhere. Why stop there? What if chaotic attractors are the state trackers and we see high dimensional representations, higher rep dimensional representations and these complex manifolds? Is, is that giving a causal role to the chaotic attractors at, at that point? I mean, so there, there is this be. recent push with... Um, with uh, chaotic regimes being computationally viable, right? It totally could be. It could be. So what I'm doing in this next paper is to, you know, in, a, in an idealized setting, in, a, in, in models alone, training networks to do tasks of increasing complexity within a certain realm, right? Mm. Let's take just decision making or just working memory, one of those things. Train these networks to do many things of increasing complexity and seeing if the thing that is tracking, if the neurons or the, the ensemble of model units within these multitasking networks that is tracking uh, different task engagements and switching at switch points, are those chaotic attractors if the task is very complex, slightly simpler mm -hmm. representations like sequences if the task is simpler, 
And can we toggle? If the task increases in complexity, do these trackers increase in complexity as well? See, this goes back to what people need to know when getting into these fields, because now everyone's going to need to know about chaos and the dynamics and the math, maybe not necessarily the math behind it, but even at a conceptual level, this stuff gets pretty heavy and confusing sometimes. So there's this, this just an open question of what you need to know, because you... My time is limited. I don't know about your time. And and I'm a ex- apparently extremely slow learner. So so you you really have to like sort of pick and choose what you're going to study because anything worthwhile it's just going to take a damn long time to really know. Again, sliver. This is my thing. This is sort of I mean my philosophy almost now at this point. Is pick a problem. So you know, here's the thing, right? It used to be Oh, I, you know, don't do any simulations. I used to solve equations by the light of the moon, and I'm going to one day write a theory of the brain. That's bullshit. We're never going to have a theory of the brain, okay? Let's just start there. Ah. So, you know, so we're not going to do, we're going to be building, you know, we're going to be sitting atop a huge pile of models. And then experimentalists and us together will either whittle or aggregate from those and a meta understanding of how we think the brain works. Mm -hmm. That's how it's going to go. And so, yeah, how much do you need to know, right? So again, pick a problem, right? Like pick a thing that you're curious about, about the brain, right? I mean, it can't be as big as, you know, dreams or consciousness because, you know, even defining those problems is hard. Sure. But pick something, right? Like how do we, you know, swallow or how do I remember phone numbers? And why is it that I remember social security numbers in three, two, and four, but phone numbers are like, you know, three, three, and four. So what is going on there? And do animals process numbers the same way? Like you walk into a room to figure out which side has, you know, more tables that are free, like walk into a, you know, a cafe and say which side has got more people. Do you do you evaluate this based on counting or do you go with a feels like? You know, these are questions like pick us, pick a sliver and then and then, you know, and then talk to people like me who will tell you, OK, read this, this and this. The minimal set. But, okay, so you've talked to people like you, and this is, I think this is, I'm hoping that this is one of the values of this show that I make, is there's huge value, I believe, in circling around, right? So you you have this sliver, and you think, how would I approach this? And then you go, but then you learn, like, six other things, and you come back around to the same sliver, and then you have a different approach. And so you, it's right. never it's... completely clear on what the correct approach is to any given problem. And the, and so to go and learn these there different facets... Gonna be one. This is the thing. There isn't going to be a correct approach. You see, like if you, you're talking to me, so my definition of the problem is, you know, quantitatively driven, right? Yeah. I'm, you know, this right. uh, this person that wants to write down something on the x-axis, but maybe somebody's intuition is more like, well, how do, you know, how do you extract from, you know, let's say videos of patient recordings, you know, things using, let's say, deep lab cut, which I'm a huge fan of, signatures of when a person you know, has an affective disorder. That could be the flavor of problems. Sorry, deep deep lab cut is the uh, recording system. Deep lab cut is a is a is a is a is a tool developed by uh, Mackenzie Mathis, who was at Harvard, and I think she's moving to Switzerland soon. Um, and it's this open source uh, software that you can you know it's a it's a markerless post estimation software. Right. Uh, she's she's also an absolute rock star. And could deeply committed to open science and dissemination of our tools and like that. But, you know, maybe the, the problem sliver that you care about are looking at people's videos and patient interviews and extracting features of, you know, when did they get depressed? I mean, what, what are their, you know, pupillary responses in response to, you know, it could be, has to be something that you're curious about. And then the approach you know, then, you know, you wouldn't be talking to me, you'd be talking to someone like Helen Mayberg and saying, okay, this is, you know, a, a problem that I care about. Do you have a data set that would be valid? Mm. Then you go learn the tool from Mackenzie, who teaches it to you for free. Man, this is fun. I uh, wish I could do this all day. Uh, kind of. I can we... imagine. Yeah. But, you know. um, well, <laughs> all right. So just to wrap up, I guess this, um, so I recommend this, this paper about how to go about studying the neural mechanisms of multiple tasks and uh, people can go and read it on their own. I, I guess in the, in the last few minutes here, if you have time, do you mind if I ask you a few more sort of broad type questions here? Go for it. So what is uh, one of the best investments of your time? We've kind of covered a lot of this already, but, but looking back, what do you think 
is, is one of the best investments you've made in your time? Best investments of my time. Um, you know, I would say 100% diving beyond seeking, um, you know, closed analytic solutions and, and writing down theorems. Mm. So, you know, at some point in my career, I mean, my PhD was all about, you know, doing these hard cal- calculations on these idealized systems. And, you know, they it just, you know, shaped who I am and the way I think and everything, right? Yeah. That said, at some point in my postdoc, I was like, well, I'm going to look at real data now. <laughs> and that was a 100% best investment of my time. You know, it took a long time. There's nothing more humbling than than real data because you know nothing behaves and that's when you know the biology's gnarly thing got tattooed to the inside of my skull but then when you solve a very small problem even within this gnarliness it has a measurable impact you know like the zebrafish thing and it's linked to this one very small sliver of this very multifaceted and complex disorder like depression but you know it's incredibly valuable and impactful so that was yeah, diving into real data for sure. I mean, and, and it hasn't sent you into a passive coping state yet, so that's good. Okay, it's <laughs> humbling. <Probably do. laughs> okay, what is uh, what's something that you used to believe that now you think is is naive? That we will one day have a grand unified theory of the brain. You don't think we're going to have a grand unified theory? I do not. I think we are going to have a set of models and mathematical theories and principles and from which we have to then glean some kind of meta understanding. Is that reason for celebration or depression? Celebration. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. It's, it's you know, it's actually giving biology the respect it deserves. You know, in, in, in all of it, it's a gnarl and warts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 100%. That, yeah. Gnarl and warts. What, what should uh, neuroscience and or artificial intelligence be doing less of? I may have talked about this a little before, and that's fighting. Fighting, uh-huh. Well, you know, we are after slightly different goals, especially, you know, given that, you know, one is largely driven industrially, one is largely driven academically and so forth, right? So there are a few differences in viewpoint and how we approach the problems. But ultimately, cooperation between these two fields and much more cross-pollination is required uh, for us to make progress. Because I think, you know, um, if, if you know, AI, uh, traditional AI models had, you know, much more regard for, uh, you know, the constraints that biology puts, the mm-hmm. biological brain, the biological nervous system puts, then it would enrich their models and uh, the tools and algorithms that they build. But from our perspective, you know, the explosive uh, and rapid advances in that field in terms of, you know, even coming up with learning algorithms yeah. could help people like me understand um, the brain better by using them as tools to pick out things from data. Well, it can be overwhelming, the, the speed of different proposed models in AI and for neuroscience to try to keep up. Do you see that as a problem? It's challenging, for sure. It's mm. challenging, for sure, also because there's, some, there's a fundamental difference in the way that we choose to disseminate our results. Right. Uh, yeah. Traditional neuroscience is still very journal driven. AI is very conference proceedings driven. On the other hand, conference proceedings have, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's in an enormous volume, right? They come out at an enormous volume without necessarily as much depth as I in my oldie timey fashion would like to see yeah. with notable exceptions and so forth. So I think, yeah, I mean, to keep up with all of it is, is definitely challenging. But, you know, you have colleagues whose work and opinions you trust and you talk to them and I have become much more focused in the classes of problems that I care about so it has come at the expense of learning broadly for yeah. sure yeah but it has gotten me deeper God, just, and I think it's it's yeah it's it's a choice I'm okay with for now just this morning I was uh, I had this moment of uh self-realization I was I had spent I don't know, I was on probably minute 15 of merely organizing my reading list, you know, like all the things I need to get to. And I was like, good God, I could have just read for 15 minutes yeah. and, and gotten it over with. That's so, right. That's right. Then thank God. I, then I had to quit. I had to come talk to you, which was the, <laughs> the best thing I've done all day. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, honestly, between you and me, I get a lot by going to um, like a smaller meeting. 
Yeah. Not like, you know, a spray and pray style meeting, but like, you know, a, a, a meeting, let's say a Janelia or something mm-hmm. or a GRC or, you know, a smaller meeting. And then people will usually describe the results of their two or three papers in that talk. And then stuff a little bit falls off. You also get just better, better human interactions, which is the, the thing that really, I think, advances ideas, generation, and then productivity. 100%. 100%. This is why, you know, this now, the, the way that we're working together in neuroscience and not in isolated silos, but in large groups of people, group thinking, yeah. it's, it, I, I'm, I've, I've become a fan. <laughs> yeah, because, well, I just had um, John Brennan on the show, who's uh, a, a linguist, and he kind of, he is one of the people who said, I wish I did more computational uh, work, more coding. Um, so he's sort of the opposite of you, but then he employs, uh, sort of offloads, I guess he says, um, that job to his collaborators and gets to learn from it. So we're, we all benefit. It's wonderful. That's right. No, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, I mean, I'm telling you, it's like physics used to be in the twenties, right? I mean, <laughs> computational neuroscience is, is there. Yeah. Where are you, I mean, what else could I be doing with my life? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so there's not going to be a grand unified theory of the brain, but what do you think is um, one, you know, given trait of our intelligence or cognition uh, that you think is is going to be really hard to understand and model and build? The the hardest, I think, would be to capture things like learning and development, right? Like how do children learn and are we going to, is there something, I mean, look, I don't pretend to think that human intelligence is this, you know, mystical, magical peak of the intelligence, uh, you know, pyramid that, you know, all models should aspire to. I literally do not. Yeah. I, I think that there's a lot to be gained by looking at things like octopodes and swarms of ants and stuff, right? I mean, so so yes, yes, I'm agnostic to that. But I think that, you know, the way that um, juvenile animals learn and then they acquire that learning or shape that learning process throughout their lifetime, uh, that one is going to be a hard one to recapitulate in these machines because there's clearly a value in that route that um, animals take or even humans take through their development. And so that one, I think, is going to be the be a hard nut to crack. Man, development always scared me. Uh, it's just because then I, but you, you're used to these things because you, you've done sequential, but just putting the element of time into anything is scary. And how Hence recurrence, right? So, so what I put time at, uh, you know, what, what I consider a longish time scale is still, you know, hours <laughs> at most, right? Yeah, yeah. The problem becomes when the hardware is changing too. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm hoping to have someone on my show who, who deals with this stuff, sort of the, the evolution. You know, Rebecca of, Sachs is your best friend. Well, I'm going to, she's on my list. Okay. She's, uh, the email will go out later today. How about that? Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. No sweat. I mean, she's a person whose work I'm a fan of is all. I don't know her personally. Yeah. She's definitely, if she'll agree, she'd definitely be on the show. Um, what, what is one of the best scientific quote unquote moments that you've had? I, I feel like there's been many. Um, especially since I've come to Sinai, right? Uh, having your own shop is, is absolutely, you know, is it? it's a, uh, yes, it is completely incredible, oh, freeing yes. intellectually. Fuck, I missed um, out. And so, the, <laughs> well, I know it's, it's a personal choice. I mean, it's not for everyone. Sure. Um, I mean, ask anyone that's been a postdoc for seven and a half years. <laughs> um, but you know, my best, I think still is, um, so I did my PhD at Columbia, Mm-hmm. Um, with Larry Abbott and Heimson Polinsky. And one of the first papers we wrote together, so Larry and I wrote together, was what's now called the Rajan Abbott distribution. So we did uh, the, we calculated the spectrum of modes that a network that is composed of excitatory and inhibitory neurons together w- would form. And so we were doing this kind of, you know, it was a tough calculation. And we were sitting in, in, in the Columbia, old Columbia Theory Center, which was, you know, kind of a fishbowl. And we were just sitting together and, you know, breaking our heads on this calculation. And uh, meanwhile, I, you know, wanted to put this into Mathematica and see, okay, look, are we, are we making an algebraic mistake somewhere? And he was doing it, you know, pen and paper. We were sitting literally side by side. And then all of a sudden, the same result popped out. We hmm. jumped out of our seats and yelled. I mean, that, to me, it was, I mean, everyone just stopped and went, freaks. Wow. That to me, and that has, you know, it was the first one like that. And it's, um, it's always been special to me. I return to that memory um, ah, often. I've got goosebumps myself. I'm, I really it was do. It's kind of a cool one. It kind of never happens. It, um, it doesn't ever happen. That's true. No, that's why, yeah. This is what I'm saying. So that's why I'm kind of holding on to that one. <laughs> 
Finally, Kanaka, what is, uh, you have a lot of ideas. You have these, this set of tools that you can apply to anything that you want, but you have a limited amount of time. Um, what is one idea that, you know, you don't have time uh, to pursue that you, that you think someone else, that you wish someone else would, or you think someone should? Right. I'm thinking, um, okay, so I have two mm -hmm. and then you can pick whichever one you like. There's the pet one that I like very much. So, you know how, uh, so I have this interest in conservation, wildlife conservation. Mm -hmm. um, I, so, so, you know, recently I've been sort of involved with this David Sheldrick Wildlife Foundation. Okay. And so they rescue elephants, orphan elephant babies that have been orphaned because of, you know, human wildlife um, conflicts or poaching mm. or what have you, right? So there are these infants that are hand raised for many, many years by humans, mm. and they're then released into the wild, reintegrated into the wild. They have certain certain behaviors that entirely wild elephants do not. So, for example, they one of these hand-reared elephants will return after 10, 15 years, and they will bring their newborn baby back to the handlers to show them and stuff. So they're not domesticated by any means, right? They're wild living animals that yeah. are, you know. I would like for someone to look at this thing called the exposome. So what are these elephants exposed to, you oh. know, their genetic makeup, their protein makeup, their epigenetics? I mean, is there anything in there that is now changed because of the way that they've been, uh, their early life has experienced? Is that a term, exposome? Exposome is apparently a term I okay. learned recently. Okay. Everything that they're exposed to in the environment, it could be the genome, the methylome, the metabolome. So that's one sort of pet thing that I wish somebody did. Then there's the other one, which again, I don't have time to do, but it relates to tools that I know how to use. Mm -hmm. So what I want to do is to build recurrent neural network models of things like social media engagement or games like Fortnite. So, you know, if I could find one of those guys and have them give me, you know, even anonymized, right? Oh. Like user data by time engagement. These are still vast time series data. And I would like to use my approach of inferring directed interactions mm -hmm. to see if the interactions are, you know, organized by um, by something sensible and, you know. But by like a higher, like a higher order principle or? Like a higher order principle. Like, for example, do these interesting modes come out of it, right? Like if I diagonalize one of the matrices of interactions from just uh, from fitting the time series data of individuals on social media, are they organized by, you know, our bubble versus the other bubble? Um, do these bubbles change as a function of what season or, you know? Why do you want to know that? So you can beat Fortnite? This is a, that's a terrible thing to say because I, I know that that, I don't, can you beat Fortnite? I don't, I don't, I don't know. know how to play Fortnite. I don't know. It's a okay. multiplayer thing. I what I want to know is, I, well, I want to know if it is, um, if there's something interesting in the way that populations, I mean, you know, you know huge number people in huge numbers are drawn to it. Yeah. Yeah, people that don't play games were hooked onto things like Twitter and Facebook for that reason, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something about population-wide engagement, I see. even without face-to-face -face or interpersonal interaction, that could have, you know, interesting mathematical properties. I wish I had something noble to say, like, oh, you know, social media and its effect on election season and the whatever. But I, I don't know, honestly not. I well, want to see this matrix of interesting properties. I'll be able to use that. I just had uh, my my wife and I... Our daughter, seven-year-old daughter, just asked us, "What if if cigarettes? What did she ask us?" It led us into the the cigarettes and addiction conversation, and then I brought up social media, and the, this is the new cigarettes right. that you're going to have to worry about. Because when I was young, we had candy cigarettes that you know were given, but uh, but now everyone's going to be socially anxious all the time if they don't have their phones on them and stuff. So so that work will be directly applicable to me and being able to describe the higher order principles under undergirding uh my daughter's addiction future addiction to social media Ugh. <laughs> well you're saying future which you know which is it uh, indicates hope and optimism so so you know yeah well, there are some positives too right to social media yes, engagement of course um, i mean we're able to do this for example of course yeah well this isn't social media however you can find kanaka on social media on twitter she's at twitter at uh rajan kdr and of course i'll link to that in the show notes and then you can also, of course, find her at rajanlab.org to learn more about what she does. Kanaka, I'm looking forward to these papers that we didn't talk about because they're coming out. Thank you for talking with me today, and I and thank I you wish so you luck. Much. I've had a I've had a delightful time, and uh, thank you so much for making the time.
Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. You can support the show through Patreon for a microscopic two or four dollars per month. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help sustain and improve the show and prohibit any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thanks for your support. See you next time. Man.